everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. If you'd like to join us live, you'll find the schedule for upcoming sessions on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions posted to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. My guests share their photography tips and insight into their creative journeys, and they inspire us to try something new and look at a subject a little differently. Tonight's guest is Jess Santos. Jess is a landscape and astrophotographer by trade, but a wanderer and adventurer chaser by heart. Her photographs are beautiful and captivating, and they'll inspire you to set out on your own wild and off the beaten track adventure. Jess is a Sony Alpha brand ambassador and an official B&H creator. As a photography workshop instructor, her schedule is filled with a variety of overlanding and backcountry adventures that offer unique opportunities to travel and learn from her. In tonight's presentation, telling stories through composition, Jess will talk about using composition to captivate your viewer and take your storytelling to the next level. If you're on Instagram, you can find Jess at Miss Jess Bess. And you can connect with her through her link tree at backslash Miss Jess Bess. And I will include all of those links in the show notes below. With that, welcome to the Happiness Hour, Jess. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for saying yes. <laughs> Even though you were trapped in a Jeep or a, I guess he's in a Jeep. I'm never not trapped. trapped. Never trapped. You were trapped. <laughs> so this is how, so just a little bit of disclosure. I, I've known about Jess for years and have seen her photos come through my feed. And I had um, Ryan Oswalt come and do a presentation for me. And he did it from the inside of his vehicle. And <laughs> we see a, a dog tail and then Jess is like waving. So while she was <laughs> trapped, I'm like, hey, would you come and do one too? So, um, so that's why she said yes. And that's why she's here. But um, gosh, I'm so excited to have you. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that you made the time to do this. So with that, I kind of gloss over people's bios. What did I miss? Feel free to share anything you'd like to fill I in. Think, I think you got it. Mostly I just spend my time traveling around mostly the Southwestern United States, but sometimes overseas and sometimes to the North, uh, desert first love. And I teach a lot of workshops <laughs> over in the desert. So, um, yeah, I just spend my time adventuring and exploring and sharing with you guys. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead and get you, let you get started because I, I don't want to take up any more time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay. <laughs> So today we're here and to talk about one of my favorite things and one of the things that really drives my photography is storytelling and adding stories to my images through composition. And I'm going to start off by telling you guys a story from my childhood. Me and my brother, we were really obsessed with Jurassic Park when we were younger and we would go to Lake Mojave on family vacation every October. And it was a very, very long drive from Southern California or what seemed like a long drive for us little kids. And we would get restless. And my mom would go and made up this game. She's look, she would say, look outside, look at the mountains, these low lying mountains that were driving by on this two lane highway. She's like, what dinosaur is sleeping under there? And we'd get so excited and we'd be like, oh, that's a Tyrannosaurus Rex sleeping down there. That's a Triceratops, whatever, whatever dinosaur we thought those mountains looked like. And I have taken this into my photography a lot because when I come and I look at scenes and I try and figure out what the story is, often it will involve dinosaurs or dragons or fantasy like things. <laughs> But I bring this up because I came across this scene in New Mexico on the left here. 
Speaking of storytelling, I was here with some friends and we had been here for the first time and immediately saw a brontosaurus, you know, the long neck dinosaur. If you ever seen land before time, little foot, you know, so I was like, I am going to photograph this. I'm going to make it look like a brontosaurus. And so I got down low to the ground with my wide angle lens and I made sure that his neck was towering over the landscape as I imagine a brontosaurus would be very tall in real life. And the whole reason I'm bringing this up is because we all know about rule of thirds, leading lines, S curves, all this sort of stuff, but these are compositional elements and they are not in fact a story. They are instead used to enhance our story. There is this toolbox that we can reach into. And once we find the story, we can use these things to actually compel the viewer into believing that maybe this is a brontosaurus. So I find when we talk about storytelling, it's usually this obscure kind of thing. Oh, yeah, just find a story. But it's really hard to pinpoint how to actually do that. So I've come up with a couple things that I think might help you guys. And we're going to go throughout that throughout this presentation. But whenever I first come to a scene, I first ask myself, what do these rocks, these mountains, these trees, these whatever I'm looking at remind me of in terms of shape? And then how can I use elements like line, shape, color, texture, space, et cetera, to tell that story? It's much like when you were a little kid and you looked up at the clouds and you're like, what does that that cloud look like? Does it look like, in this case, to me, it looks like an elephant. It could look like something else to you and that's okay. Um, So just how we can make those look more like that through composition. We can find great inspiration in painters and translating our story to our audience isn't always easy to do. Uh, The story doesn't have to be literal or even plausible. As you can see, there obviously was not a brontosaurus running around the New Mexico Badlands because I'm sure that would have hit news, even though as much as I wish there was. But I bring this up because I've included a painting here by my favorite artist, um, my favorite painter, Salvador Dali. You probably have heard of him if you've ever taken an art class or anything like that. But he's a surrealist painter. And art like surrealism has a really grand, fantastical story. But that story isn't always easy to interpret. Like this painting to the right here, it's called The Shades of Night Descending. And at first glance, we could say, oh, well, it's just, you know, the sun's setting and the shadows are casting long across the land. And that's what this is about. But if you look a little bit closer, you see this tiny little rock in the middle and his darker shadow pointing to this weird white figure huddled up against that rock in the background. And if you look even closer, and I always miss this, but on the bottom right hand corner, there's this almost mummy like person. And we have no idea what this painting is about. Only Salvador Dali himself, or unless he said it, what it was about would know, right? But because it has a story, it's instantly more engaging. We want to invite our viewers to translate our stories that we put into our work into their own story. So just because you didn't see a brontosaurus in the first picture doesn't mean that there's not a story there and something that you could come back to and keep looking. I wanted to show this image because this arch has a specific name and I haven't ever really shared this image before because I honestly got up this hike, which was pretty brutal in Grand Staircase Escalante, right as the sun had set and I had very little time to actually capture anything. But the reason I wanted to show it here is because when we're talking about what things look like. And if I asked you, what what does this arch look like? It has a very specific name. And once I say the name, you can't unsee it. But it's called Kissing Dragon's Arch. And that's exactly what it looks like, is two dragons kissing from this angle in particular. So if that's the story there, I wish I had had more time to compose this image. So Anyways, but I decided I wanted to make it into a twilight scene. I wanted to include stars because I thought it was oh so romantic that these dragons are kissing under starlight, you know? Um, So looking at things and seeing what they might resemble or look like, and then how can we tell that story in a better light? So 
Here are tools to help you tell your story. Again, we all know about rule of thirds, leading lines, et cetera, et cetera. These are classic things that everyone talks about. But I want to talk about a couple of tools that tell, help you tell a deeper story through composition that you might not actually think about on a daily basis or when you're going out and looking for your, your shots or anything like that. And the first thing I want to talk about is focal length. I often am shooting with a very wide angle lens and there's a specific purpose to this. It's mostly to get really up close to my subject. So it almost appears as things are coming out at me, but you can use focal length to tell all sorts of different stories. You can use focal length to, to bring a distant object in closer to you or a wide angle to bring things that almost appear to pop out of the screen. Focal length is a really, really important tool. And so when you find your story and you're looking at your composition, try and determine what focal length would best fit that story and would best put those elements where you want them to be. And then move with your feet, not with your zoom, because different focal lengths often obviously do different things. And so by moving with our feet, we're going to use those focal lengths to their best abilities. So in this image on the left, this was taken up in the Colorado mountains during wildflower season. And it always comes back to haunt me, dinosaurs and all that sort of thing. I was in a field full of wildflowers, so many different wildflowers, colors, shapes, sizes, whatever. There were so many there. It was such a good year for wildflowers. And what did I focus in on? What caught my eye the most? This little leafy, ferny plant. That's what caught my eye. <laughs> I don't know why. I can't explain it. I mean, I could. It's basically, it reminded me it, like it was straight out of the jungle of Jurassic Park. I, I am obsessed. I don't know why. I can't help it. And so I wanted to kind of create this scene as if you were sitting in the Jeep in Jurassic Park and a T-Rex could come out from any moment at the fog. That's the whole kind of vibe and feel that I wanted for this image. So I decided to shoot this as a focal length blend. I used two different focal lengths to create this because when I'm shooting with a wide angle, often the mountains in the distance or anything towards the center of a wide angle lens will actually get smaller. And that's not what I wanted. That's not how I was actually seeing the scene because I was so close to these mountains. So I used a wide angle lens to shoot the foreground. And that was about, I believe I was at like 16 or 18 millimeters. It's on my Instagram if you want to see the actual settings. But the mountain I was shot probably at I'm going to say 24, but I can't remember exactly. That's not the point. It's the point is that I used a wider angle lens to shoot the foreground and a longer focal length to shoot the mountains. And then I blended them together in Photoshop. And so I moved with my feet instead of my zoom. I got as close as I could to this bushy plant and used the wide angle distortion to my advantage. And then I brought the mountain into me. And then tripod height is a very, very important thing here too, um, especially with landscape photography. If I were to be much taller with my tripod for this specific shot, the river would have taken up much more of the frame than I wanted it to. So I'm actually hi hiding part of the river behind these white flowers by being a little lower on my tripod. And then if I was too low, I would have lost some of that current that's rushing over the rocks and those longer exposure pieces there. So moving with your feet and your tripod height, it's a game of millimeters. And I'll keep reiterating it, that throughout this presentation. Then your foreground, your midground, your background, and your sky, you can use these to create depth. I like to say that if you cover up two thirds of your image, when you're out in the field and you're looking at your image, trying to figure out if it's a good composition, cover up two thirds of your image. Is there something interesting there? Cover up the other two thirds of your image. Is there something interesting there? And if there's something interesting, at least two thirds of the image, then you probably have a decent shot. So we want to use our mid ground, our foreground, our background, our sky and create depth through this. So in this case, I'm using the plants and the flowers and the foreground, the river and the fog in the midground, and then the mountains and the stars in the background. 
And then there's a connection between our subject matter and our sky. And I'm going to get more into detail here on this one, because I think it's hugely important in terms of composition. Oftentimes, if you're shooting during the day, um, sunset, sunrise, etc., we just think we're given what we're given. And really, the sky changes, the clouds change, the light changes. That's always really important. And it needs to connect with your foreground. It shouldn't be just something pretty that's there, especially when you're shooting night photography images and the Milky Way, you don't want the Milky Way to just be there. You want it to connect with your foreground in a meaningful way. And then you can use color to convey emotion or time. This is another really great tool that we don't often think of in the field, but um, you can think of it whether I choose to think of it in the field, but also post-processing plays an important role there. But using color to convey an emotion or a time period is really important. In this case, I shot this during blue hour. So obviously there's a lot of blue tones, but I leaned really heavily in that too in the editing. And the reason being is I, I believe that blue is more of a peaceful color. It offers a stillness something like that. And it reminded me of the scene in Jurassic Park where I think they're sitting in the Jeep and there's a cup of water, maybe in the cup holder. I can't remember exactly. Right. And you can't hear the T-Rex coming. It's still, it's quiet. And all you see is the vibration of the water as the T-Rex's feet move. And so I wanted to kind of create that stillness in this image. So I leaned heavily, heavily into the blue tones because that makes me feel calm and peaceful. And then all of a sudden the T-Rex comes out. <laughs> uh, light and shadow to direct the eye through the frame, even with blue hour or night shots, this is also really important. You can tell here I'm using the white of the flowers, the white of the long exposure on the current in the river, the white of the and the white of the stars to direct your eye from the beginning of the frame from whatever is closest to the camera to whatever is farthest away from the camera. Now, in this case, I'm using the lighter areas in the image because our eyes are drawn to warm, bright things. And there's not a lot of warm color here. So the bright part is really important in this shot in particular. And then I can't recommend enough scouting your location prior to your shoot and learning the history or the geology of the area because you can use these things to tell stories about whatever piece of this planet you are in. And finally, something that is really important to think about when telling your story is aperture. In this case, I shot this as a focus stack because I wanted it to be sharp from front to back. But you can often use aperture at a lower aperture, say f2.8, f4, something like that to really draw the viewer's eye into what you want them to focus on versus getting lost in all the clutter around it. I want to show you guys this time lapse really fast because I want to touch on light and color just so you can see it kind of in real time. And please ignore the dust spot on this, <laughs> this time lapse. But... I think it's really important to know how light and color affect a scene and how important it is to arrive early and to actually wait it out because you might find that the light isn't the best at sunset or golden hour. Maybe it's better in blue hour light or maybe that just helps tell your story better. So I'm going to play this. And what happened is the clouds are covering up the sun right now, but in a minute you'll see the golden hour light hit right there and then the sun will set. And now we see the colors and the clouds start to light up because the sun is starting to go below the horizon. And then everything goes blah, all gray. But then shortly after that, and this is about 40 minutes after sunset, we run into blue hour and you'll start to see the landscape change again for a brief moment where it has that afterburner afterglow before it falls completely into shadow like this, how it ended. So there's a lot of opportunity to shoot the same scene in different light, in different color, in different ways to get a different story and a different emotional impact. I promised you I was going to talk about how the sky and the clouds interact because I think it's so, so important. But the sky plays an important role in the story and we want to consider how and when you want to shoot. That's why I showed you that time lapse because things change. And exposure blending, long exposure, or sky replacement are all tools we can use. Um, if you're into, I'm, I'm very big advocate for composites. I replace skies often. That's just, 
I do it all for the photograph and all for the story. I'm less of a naturalist, but if that's not your thing, I completely understand it. Just knowing when the right time to shoot is, is really important. So patience is key and waiting for perfect timing, especially in color and light, like I just showed you in the time lapse. And making sure sky and clouds are communicating with your foreground elements to further your story. And I'm showing this image in particular here because this is a, a dune field out in Death Valley, California. And these flowers appear in the early parts of the year, I think like March, April, sometimes it depends. It changes from year to year. But what's so fascinating about the San Verbena is that if you were to go to this exact location where I'm exactly standing for this shot, any other time of the year, there would be nothing there, just sand. These aren't bushes that stay here year round and they just bloom when it's time for them to bloom in the spring. These bushes literally appear out of nowhere and they don't appear every year. This was back in 2020 and I've been back to this spot every year since and it hasn't happened yet. So it's kind of a rare thing to happen and it's just so fascinating that they just suddenly appear out of the sand. And what happens is these seeds lay dormant and they can lay dormant for decades. And then all of a sudden with the right amount of rain in the winter and the right amount of not wind in the spring, they'll start to emerge and bloom and break those hard shells that have kept them protected and they'll bloom into this beautiful carpet of flowers. So what it reminded me of was a uh, little shop of horrors and the little plant, <laughs> the feed me Seymour. It reminded me of this. I called it my little flower monster. And so when I went to compose this, because I wanted it to appear that it's crawling out of the sand, you can see these arms kind of outstretched and the little head in the middle, sort of a turtle shape. And that's why I chose this particular plant. Um, but when I shot it, I did actually have a good sunset. It was a really good sunset, but it wasn't right for the image. And a couple of days prior, I had been up north, like four hours north of this. And I had captured just a sky for what I like to call my sky bank. And it had this cool X pattern going on because you have the pink on the right and the darker pink gray on the left. So they come together in a kind of an X pattern and that mimicked the foreground. And I felt like it was so much more impactful to have this sky than the sky that was actually there. Not that I'm saying you have to replace every sky. Just think about the story when you're out there shooting. And is this the right clouds? Is this the right light for this particular story? And like I said, consider a sky replacement. If it helps tell your story and that's your thing, maybe it's better than the original shot. Maybe it's not for you. For anyone who shoots night photography, I want to talk briefly about how the Milky Way interacts. I have some bad news for you night photographers. The Milky Way alignment is not everything. I know, I know it's really sad because we as astrophotographers, myself included, like to chase the Milky Way core and that's what we like to shoot and we would do anything to have the Milky Way core in our shot. But just because the Milky Way aligns with your foreground does not mean it enhances your story. Making sure the Milky Way is communicating with your foreground elements to further your story is going to be way more impactful. And if it doesn't, consider shooting a different constellation or just pure twilight stars to tell a better story, such as Orion or Cassiopeia, or the, the Big Dipper. You know, any of those constellations are also great too. In this case, the Milky Way, I believe, enhances the story. This was taken out in the famous sailing stones of Death Valley. And if you've never been out here or never even heard of them, these are stones that mysteriously, now not so mysteriously, move by themselves across this playa and they leave these trails behind them. And so they call them the sailing stones. And there's some local folklore that even Death Valley will say exists. <laughs> uh, there's this big rock formation out in the middle of the playa that you don't see here, but it's called the grandstand. And the piece of local folklore is that the aliens sit on the grandstand and they race these stones around at night when no one's watching. And so when I went out there to shoot, this wasn't my first time photographing the sailing stones, but I knew that I wanted to tell that story somehow eventually in an image from the racetrack playa. 
So I found these two stones. They had decent tracks. The tracks change from year to year, depending on rain, wind, et cetera. But you can kind of see their trails leading off behind them and where their trails interact with the horizon and where the Milky Way interacts with the horizon is very important to the story because I wanted it to appear as if these stones had come from the sky, as if the aliens had thrown these stones down on earth, sat on the grandstand and raced them around. That was the story I was going for. So in this case, the Milky Way was important to my story, but also the Milky Way only lines up here in like April, May. After that, it's way too far to the right. So there's a very small window where you can actually capture this like it. So being patient and waiting it out for perfect timing is also really important. Where's Waldo? <laughs> Does anyone remember Where's Waldo? I will say that. I know you guys can't talk back to me right now, but I know some of you remember Where's Waldo. And if I let you watch and stare at this, you would probably eventually find Waldo. But the reason I wanted to show you guys this is this is kind of like what's happening when we walk onto a scene and we're trying to find our story. We're trying to find Waldo, so to speak. And so the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to encourage you to guys, especially in landscape photography, but I think this works for a lot of different types of photography, is when you show up to the studio, the city, the, the landscape, whatever place or thing you're photographing, just sitting there for a moment with the scene and observing it and looking at it before you put your camera between you and your subject is so, so important to finding your story, really analyzing that and finding Waldo in this sea of chaos, because there's so many different things you can photograph here, but there's only one story that you want to tell through that. And I like to call this the art of noticing. Storytelling is so much more. It's about using your five senses and connecting, in my case, to wild landscapes and to being a small piece of that place for a short amount of time. And we get the opportunity to share this with whoever's following, whoever sees our prints, whoever sees our work in a magazine, whatever the case may be, however you show off your work or don't show off your work, you get to be a piece of that for a short time. So arriving early allows you to look at the scene from all angles. After you've sat with it for, say, 15 minutes, I encourage you to sit with it for 15 minutes. Then go and look at it from all angles, maybe with your phone, maybe just with your eyeballs before you put yourself or your camera between you and the scene, because it's really important to actually visualize it and be present in there. And then find one composition. And I know for landscape photographers, this is really, really hard. I see so many people running around shooting all sorts of different shots. And I promise you, you will be much more successful in finding and telling your story based on one composition. Take control of that entire frame and only include pieces that are relevant to your story. I hear a lot of times also crop out this or crop out that, I'll do that in post-production. As much as you can get right in camera is going to be so much more impactful when it actually comes to editing. Because there's so many nuances that by cropping and stuff like that, you might lose. So take control of the entire frame. And then don't just think about your subject, their lighting and their positioning. Be aware of the whole scene and the surrounding details, the shadows, the bright areas, etc. In this case, this image on the left was taken out at the Grand Canyon in the North Rim. And it's actually just a still from a longer time lapse. I actually had two time lapses going because we had waited, my friend and I had waited there for three or four days um, with no clouds, no nothing. And I had shot the same scene that I'll show you a little bit later over and over. And then all of a sudden we got this amazing dramatic sky and this time lapse actually was shot over six hours of footage because it was just so epic. But what that allowed me to do by focusing this one camera on this scene and not moving it for six hours, I shot all different kinds of light, all different types of clouds, rainbows, God rays, all sorts of different things. And then I could combine pieces of those together because often all the elements don't happen at the same time. And so this is called exposure blending. 
and you can use this tool to your advantage, or you just have a ton of options and you can pick out the one with the perfect light where the light rays are coming down on exactly where you want them to go. So by focusing on the one and taking control of that scene, you're gonna have much more success in telling that story. I have an, one more time lapse to show you. This was from my other camera that same day. This one was on the right, that one was on the left, and I literally sat there and watched the sunset while the camera did all the work. But I wanna show you this because there's so much happening, and this one was only a, over a period of maybe two hours, I believe. So it's a much shorter time, but in that two hours, so much happened. And I wanna see just what you guys can notice. Noticing the God rays and how they interact or those light rays and how they interact with the scene. And then the clouds break up a little bit and start to get some color in the, the horizon line. And eventually you'll see a sunburst on the right and the color of the clouds change dramatically, but look what's happening to the foreground during that time, it's so dark. So oftentimes these things don't happen together and by, by just focusing on something and shooting it over and over as the light changes, you'll have so many more options. I'm gonna dive into a couple photographs. I'm gonna tell you the story about each of them and the techniques or the elements from my little compositional toolbox that I use to tell that story. And hopefully this can help you in, once you find the story, figuring out how to tell that story better. So this first image was taken out in Texas in the swamps of East Texas on the Louisiana border. And these trees, they turn these beautiful orange color at, uh, in November, in the fall. And we had paddled out on this little pond, I guess you would call it, <laughs> and kind of floated to this little island. And we were walking around this little island and I noticed these two trees and it looked like they were dancing. Oops go back. There we go. It looked like they were dancing like beauty and the beast up there in a backdrop of gold, like oranges and gold. So focal length played a very important role here. I chose to do a little bit longer of a focal length than I'm normally doing. And when I say longer, it was probably like 24 to 30. <laughs> I'm usually at 12 millimeters if I can be. And then I included these um, two trunks. So I call it a frame within a frame. So I kind of have these two trunks on the left and the right framing out. And the reason I did this is because I want you to feel like as a viewer, you're walking through this forest and you stumbled across these two trees having a moment they're dancing in this autumn foliage and you don't want to disturb their moment. So you're kind of just watching from a distance. And this will be an ongoing technique that I use throughout my photographs. And then I used an aperture of f2.8 to isolate the dancing trees because it's called clearing the chaos. There's all this chaos happening behind and in front because I included those trees in front. And I wanted to make sure that your focus was on the dancing trees. Even though the fall foliage is beautiful, your eye hopefully goes to the dancing trees first. And then I dodged the moss or brightened the moss a lot that was hanging from not only the dancing trees, but the trees in front and the trees behind because that Spanish moss is just absolutely stunning. And I kind of felt like it was swirling with them. So I wanted to highlight that area. This one was taken actually not too far from where I actually am now, about 30, 40 minutes away. <laughs> I like to call this rock formation, the Sphinx. I, I don't know if it has a real name, but that's just what I've always called it because when I'm looking this way, you can't see it, but right to the right of me is this huge butte. And so when you're looking from the road, as you drive down to this rock formation, it looks like a Sphinx guarding the pyramids. So that's why I've always called it the Sphinx. And so I wanted to make you feel like you're Indiana Jones and you're on this epic adventure and you stumble up this ridge. And all of a sudden you see this magnificent artifact of ancient history, right? So I created that spectator feeling by including the front ridge in the frame. I could have excluded it, but I feel like it takes away from that story that I'm trying to tell. And then timing the light to create dimension. This was shot at sunrise, at golden hour sunrise. 
if I had shot this at sunset, the light would be on the opposite side. So you wouldn't have much light illuminating the surfaces of the Sphinx. So paying attention to when the sun rises and sets and where the light is when it does that is really, really important. And this is also goes for blue hour shots as well as I'll get into, but light is so important in creating things to make them look a certain way. And then I touched on tripod height before, but tripod height here played an important role because if I was too low, that back right leg of what I like to call the Sphinx would be hidden. Like you wouldn't see where it went into the ground and it would create what's called a tangency. So those would be too close together and your eye would just go right there. And if your tripod was too high, you would have a lot of dirt just there for no reason. And it would create separation in not a great way between this ridge and the Sphinx, and it wouldn't give that spectator feel. So this is a game of millimeters because this was shot using a wide angle lens. So it's a game of millimeters up, down, left, right. This next one was also shot out in Grand Staircase Escalante, not anywhere near Kissing Dragon's Arch, um, but another arch of the Utah desert. And what I find so fascinating about this particular arch is that everywhere around this, you are in a sea of red sandstone. But for some reason, right in front of this arch are these really dark black rocks with this really beautiful seafoam green, vibrant lime green lichen attached to them. And while I see lichen all the time in the desert, it's not something I commonly associate with the desert. So... I imagined, here's my story about this tale, is this arch was formed because a meteor crashed down into this rock, creating a hole blasting through it. And these black rocks are not of this world. They're parts of that meteor from space. Obviously, this is not how this arch was formed. That's just the story I made up in my head. Um, but I used my wide angle lens and the distortion and got really up close to these rocks. And what this does is on the short edges of your wide angle lens, it will really stretch things out of the frame and really kind of make them appear as they're coming at you, as I wanted to make these rocks appear that way they were coming at you. And then I lined the Milky Way in the center. It does actually align, just not this time of year when I shot this. Um, but I had the Milky Way in the center because I wanted you to be able to catch a little glimpse of the Milky Way through the hole in the arch so that it would put some connection between the stars and these rocks in the foreground. And then because I shot this foreground at blue hour, uh, the lichen didn't have that vibrancy that it had in real life when I was standing there just because of the white balance I was using and the way I shot it. So I really used HSL sliders and color enhancement techniques and post-processing to really bring out that vibrant sea foam green on the rocks. Two more. This one again out in the mountains of Colorado during wildflower season. This was actually my first trip out there and I had never seen paintbrush this color. The paintbrush is the kind of flower that's in the front. I had seen red paintbrush in the desert and pink paintbrush, but this was like this really weird neon green, white, yellow kind of color. And then we got a rainbow and fog. And it just really reminded me of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So again, I'm using my wide angle lens distortion and I'm tilting down. So our inclination with a wide angle lens, a 12 millimeter to 18 millimeter, our inclination is to go really low to the ground and really close to the subject. And while this may work for some images, I highly recommend if you ever shoot with a wide angle lens, try getting close up on your subject, lifting your camera slightly up and then tilting down, if, especially if you're shooting vertically, because you'll find that on the short edges of the frame, the flowers really, really come out or cacti or whatever it is you are shooting will really seem to pop out of that frame and it'll give it so much more dimensional qualities. And then layers and leading lines I used here, especially. So we have the flowers in the center and you can see that they continue on about halfway through the frame and connect with that stream, which also connects with the rainbow. So it connects the rainbow to the flowers in the foreground. 
I shot this as a focal length blend because again, with a wide angle lens, the mountain will appear much smaller because it's much closer to the center of the frame in the actual shot. This is a four by five crop. Um, so I shot the flowers at about 12 millimeters and the mountain I believe was at 24 millimeters. And then by the time the rainbow had popped out, the light on that mid ground was way too bright and all that sort of thing. So I used an earlier frame where it was kind of even light and I exposure blended it as well. So this is a lot of techniques all in one, but it's all used to further the story. The last one I wanna show you is probably one of my favorite images of all time um, that I've taken personally. And this again was taken along with those not on the same day, but along with those, that time lapse and everything from the Grand Canyon. And we had shot here for three days straight, like I said, with bluebird skies with absolutely nothing. And I had shot this composition over and over and over exactly like this waiting for conditions. But it, eventually I decided I wanted it to be a Milky Way shot. But I was so fascinated with this composition because immediately when I saw it, I thought of the Hobbit and the dragon smog. And so I included a little quote from the Hobbit here because I think it describes it perfectly for what I was seeing while I was standing there. So I'm gonna read it to you really fast. It says, there he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. Thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail and all about him on all sides stretching away, across the unseen floors lay countless piles of precious things, gold, gems, and jewels, and silver, red stain in ruddy light. And that's exactly what I saw in this scene. I saw a sleeping dragon on his pile of gold, and I shot this over and over and over. I was so excited about it. And, and so I wanted to shoot this as a Milky Way, but I didn't want to just have the Milky Way there. I wanted to have clouds and the Milky Way. And so I searched what I like to call my sky bank high and low for a Milky Way shot that would work with this story that I was trying to tell. And I found this one with darker clouds and they're a little bit thicker and they almost look like wisps of smoke coming up from the horizon as if this dragon had gone out and burned some village and he had come back and was laying on his pile of riches. So again, tripod height played a very important role here because I wanted to create that specter as a spectator feeling as if you were Bilbo Baggins and you had come across Smog the Dragon, if you know anything about The Hobbit, <laughs> and come across Smog the Dragon and there he lay sleeping and you're like, oh, shh, let me be quiet, right? So my tripod height played an important role. If I was too high, you wouldn't really get that spectator feeling. There would be too much distance between the ridge and the dragon sleeping down below. And if I was too low, I would have cut off his nose or part of his body. And again, it wouldn't have looked so much like a dragon. And then I highlighted the subject in post-processing. So of course this was shot during sunset blue hour. And so the side light is coming in from the sun that has already set but you can see how it illuminates that ridge and the nose of the dragon and the head of the dragon. And I really brought that out in post-processing. But what I also did was darken all the areas around him so that he was the center and the attention and your eye didn't really go to any other ridge. So I really worked hard on darkening everything else in post-processing. So I wanna give you some ideas to spark your imagination or inspiration and jumpstart your right brain, your creative thinking. Um, just some ideas that you can look for when you go out into nature or the city or whatever you shoot. Um, these are more for landscape photography because that's what I do, but um, hopefully you can take these into other areas of photography as well. Uh, but just some stories that you might want to look for as you're out adventuring and wandering around. 
I like to look for constellation stories. I've become really fascinated with stories of the stars that our ancestors used to tell. They used to make up so many stories about these tiny little points of light in the sky. And we can do the same thing in our landscapes or use these stories to mimic them in our landscapes. There's so many great stories about Orion or Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Cassiopeia, et cetera. So learning these constellation stories are gonna be really helpful, especially if you're night photography. And then the shapes of clouds, the shapes of rocks, mountains, trees, etc. All these shapes, again, I'll reiterate this because this is kind of how I started in storytelling and landscapes. And this was the easiest way for me to get into it is just looking around, seeing what those reminded me of. And then maybe you have a fair, favorite fairy tale or a favorite myth or some sort of fan, fantasy story that you like, like I had with um, the Hobbit, or in this case, Alice in Wonderland was a great inspiration for this shot. Um, you know how after she eats a little piece of cookie or biscuit or whatever, and she goes into Wonderland and she's small and all the plants and mushrooms and grass and everything is so big around her. And because this area in the New Mexico Badlands look a lot like mushrooms, I thought, hey, I wanted it to make it look like you were small and you were walking through these towers mushrooms over you. So I included this on the right edge, kind of framing it as well as on the left edge. And then of course, the main subject being the one in the middle. So I drew inspiration from Alice in Wonderland, but there could be something else that inspires you there. And then stories of geology or the environment or take it to a scientific level and tell that story about that that place. I was teaching a workshop a couple of years back and we were out in Goblin Valley and we had had this talk about storytelling and how to come up with stories. And then I set all the students free and I said, I'm going to come find you and you're going to have to tell me the story about your photograph. And so I found one of the clients and he was like, I want to tell the story of old growth and new growth. And he had found this beautiful, like grassy bush and it was vibrant and green. And then behind it were all these red hoodoos in Goblin Valley, if you've ever been. And so he wanted to tell the story of how this new growth of this, this plant in the middle of the desert, no other plants around it. And then the old growth of the hoodoos that it took thousands or millions of years to form that way. And that's just a really unique way to tell the story of a place. So knowing the geology or even the history or the local folklore behind where you're standing your feet is a good story. And then if you get stuck, you found a story, but you don't know what elements to include or not include. I often suggest in your head or in a notepad or in the notes in your phone, write a six word story about that, because by only including six words, you have to include the most important parts. And that's what you can focus on when you're composing. So in this case, she walked through the mushroom land is what I wanted to, I wanted to make it feel like you were walking through these towering mushrooms. And that's the important part about this story. Two more things. To become a better storyteller, you must tell more stories. And not only just tell stories, next time you're telling your story of your adventure or a trip to the supermarket or something you're funny your dog did yesterday it doesn't matter what you're telling a story about but include the details of that story because if I were to tell you I went to Reflection Canyon once to photograph the river running through the canyon and I got there and it was a thunderstorm and I thought I was going to die but I didn't I didn't really get any pictures and then I left home that's not a fascinating story. No one wants to hear that. That's kind of boring. You're like, oh, cool. Sorry, you didn't get any pictures. But if I were to say, so I had to take a boat five hours and then I had to dock that boat on a narrow little shore and walk up this really sketchy cliff. The rocks were tumbling down as we were hiking up there. We get to the location and we go to shoot and all of a sudden the wind kicks up, the thunder kicks up and the lightning kicks up. And my friend setting up his tent, his tent starts to fly and it flies over my head. He somehow manages to run and catch it and fall back down. And so we're like, not shooting anymore. We're going to go sit in our tents because it's safer. And as I'm laying there in the tent next to my friend, I turn to her and I say, if lightning struck our tent, would we die? 
And we sat there all night thinking about that. We ultimately determined that, yeah, we probably wouldn't come out unscathed because the tent is so close to us. And as the thunder and the lightning grew closer, we rarely got any sleep that night. But we awoke to a beautiful, beautiful sunrise, managed to capture one image, and then it started to rain again. And we had to run out of there before the rock around us turned too wet and I almost fell into the canyon much more engaging story. And that's what the reality is that really happened. But by just telling a story without including those details, you don't have any context. And the same goes for your photographs. I know this seems not related, but it is in reality, because when we're looking at the details, like in this shot, this tree is literally growing out of a rock. How crazy is that? If I had cut off the part of the rock, those details, that part of the story, I'm missing something there, right? So being able to include the right details and include more details as subtle as they may be will instantly make your photograph more engaging and help tell your story better. I want to end on this idea that creativity is not learned, but rather unlearned. There was a creative creativity research study that was conducted with 1,600 children age five by a guy named George Land in 1968. And he had also performed this test with NASA scientists and engineers. 98% of the children were deemed creative geniuses at the age of five. So he was so excited, he decided to conduct the same test with 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds, and the results were actually quite shocking. The percentage dropped to 30% and 12% respectively. So the 10-year-olds were 30% creative genius and the 15-year-olds were 12% creative genius. And then again, he conducted the study with 180,000 adults, average age of 31, and only 2% fell in the realm of creative genius. So as we grow older and we navigate through this world, we unfortunately start losing creativity. So I'm saying this because I want to encourage you guys next time you're out shooting in the studio, in the streets, in the crazy mountains or landscape or underneath the stars is to let your creativity flow wild and bring back that childlike sense of wonder and experience the world like you did as you were a little kid or like I did as a little kid driving down to Lake Mojave and looking and finding sleeping dinosaurs in the hills. It would really, really enhance not only your experience in these places, but also your stories through your images. So that's all I have for you guys. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. I'm going to ask you to share, uh, take down your screen and there is, we can see your face. Okay. So what a vivid imagination lady. <laughs> Cool, cool um, storyteller. Um, there's got to be a little children's book in there somewhere. I know. One day, one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got something for you. Deborah okay. Crane said those neon greenish, neon yellow flowers are called lemon paintbrush. Oh, very cool. That would make sense because they are lemon colored. <laughs> I was trying to figure out that they were yellow because they weren't really yellow and they weren't really white. So I'm like, I just don't know what kind they are. All right. So I've got a few questions for you. So uh -huh. this is from Andrew, my friend in South Dakota. He's curious, how often do you focus stack versus just go for a single or a couple of shots with a large uh, depth of field? So most of the time I am focus stacking. And the reason being is, A, I think the universe has decided that I should be an astrophotographer because I never get good clouds in the sky. Um, but when I'm shooting for astrophotography, I need to have everything in focus because it would look strange if the sky was in focus and my blue hour foreground wasn't. But also because I'm using a really, really wide angle lens and really close to my subject. So even at an aperture of F16, halfway through the frame, you're going to be out of focus. So there are very few times that I will not focus stack. Majority is focus stacking. Okay. Um, Andrew's on a roll. He's got another one. Um, is there a specific reason most of all your photos are vertical and your videos are landscape? So is there 
Yeah. So I always shoot any sort of time lapse or video in landscape format in case I ever want to do something with YouTube. <laughs> I actually, in recent years, in like two or three years ago, got really, really into videography and I've started doing that a lot more. So a lot of my, all of my time lapses are uh, horizontally. And then I set up a second camera if I want a vertical time lapse for social media. In terms of my images, and I will say this in two parts, when I first started out doing photography and because again, I use a 12 millimeter wide angle, I just am more comfortable with really stretching things in a vertical fashion. However, I would caveat that by saying, I have started to try and get into more horizontal images. And the reason being is that I found that any images that get licensed by say Sony or B&H or any of the brands that I work with, if it's not specifically for social media, they have always picked the horizontal version of the image. So I've tried to lean more horizontal, in, but my comfort is in vertical, if you will. That's good. That's interesting. Okay. So Joe's question. I love this, Joe. This is, this is get, gets us a little geeky. How often do you have to change batteries and how many do you carry on a shoot? So when I first bought, so I've been Sony all the way. And if anyone's ever shot Sony before the a seven, I think it was R three. I want to say, um, they had really horrible battery life. So I would literally carry seven batteries around. And when I bought my a seven R three, I bought, so I had seven batteries and then I never used them, <laughs> but I still carry them around. Usually I only go through like maybe two batteries a week, but it also depends on how much video or time-lapse I'm shooting. In the case of the Grand Canyon time-lapse, the one that I drew the still from, that was a six hour time-lapse. I actually had to change the battery about four and a half hours in, and I started with a fresh battery. So it just really depends on what I'm shooting and how long I'm shooting for. And maybe some cold weather too. Yeah. Cold weather, especially with those old Sony batteries. I remember one time I was in the Eastern Sierras, it was eight degrees out. And I put the battery in, in my R2 and I took one shot and then it was black frames. And I'm like freaking out because there's all this fog and this sunset and it was beautiful. And I'm like, oh God. So I'm taking the batteries out and putting a battery hand warmer on and putting it, it was horrible. <laughs> so keeping batteries warmer is important. Um, Cynthia. Okay. Does the story need to be obvious to the viewer? Cause she doesn't think any of her photos have an obvious story. It never has to be obvious to the viewer. As long as you have a story that's in there, it will immediately become more in, more impactful to a viewer because what happens is, like I said, you don't see a brontosaurus in every single picture that I show you, right? But I see dinosaurs and dragons everywhere. And that doesn't matter. It immediately becomes where the viewer sees that there's a story there and they're trying to figure it out. I don't know if you've ever been to like, like I was talking about Salvador Dali, I love looking at his art because you have no idea what it's about, <laughs> no idea whatsoever. And so you can get lost in these little worlds that he creates and you can do the same thing for your viewer. They don't have to see what you're, what you see. Um, so many nice comments. I just, I love <laughs> people. You are just so, um, just so generous with, um, your comments and, and you're so nice to my guests. Okay. So <laughs> Carolyn wants to know as she's moving her way from Washington state to her new home in Arizona, she wants to know, do you do workshops in Arizona? She I, <laughs> I do sometimes. I will always do a private workshop in Arizona in terms of group workshops. I hopefully next year, we're going to have a best of Arizona workshop. Um, but we haven't got it fully formulated yet. Um, and we were also thinking about a monsoon season storm chasing one, but those are on the books, but in terms of, or in the works, I should say, but in terms of private workshops, yes, I do do private workshops in Arizona. <laughs> So Carolyn, you need to sign up for her newsletter. <laughs> so gosh, there was something I skipped here. Okay. So we're going to jump back to batteries. This is from Valerie, who is a workshop leader in Pennsylvania. Um, she wants to know, do you ever use one of those dummy batteries that plug into a power bank? 
So oftentimes I'm not shooting time lapses that long. (laughs) That was just an insanely epic like conditions. Most of the time, especially night time lapses too, I just let it run until the battery dies. In that particular case, I had to change the battery, but the batteries last a pretty good amount of time. So I haven't needed to use that, but yeah, if you're shooting a long, long time lapse, then yeah, you would want one of those. Or you don't even need a dummy battery with my camera. You just actually plug the camera into the power bank using a micro USB or a USB-C, depending on what Sony camera you have. And I'm sure Nikon and Canon can do the same. Okay. Um, hopefully your OM system can Valerie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, whatever camera you use, whatever, it should yeah. be able to be able to plug just into a USB power bank. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, I knew that Deborah said it was lemon paintbrush. So mm-hmm. Gail, who spends a lot of time in Colorado and Gail is kind of like, uh, she doesn't know this, but she's kind of like my little personal wildflower expert in Texas, but she thinks that it might be, uh, she says the she knows the paintbrush as sulfur paintbrush, which is based on her wallflower hmm. group. Colorado. So maybe check those two out. Either yeah. way, pretty. I've never seen anything like that. Um, Donna is curious. If you are shooting a six hour time lapse, how frequently are you capturing an image? So this really depends on A, your subject matter and B, how fast the clouds are moving. So in this case, the clouds were moving extremely fast but they were moving fast enough. So my go-to to to start in terms of time-lapse is an interval of five seconds with clouds. But if I have any sort of fog or the clouds are moving extremely fast, I jump that down to one or even two seconds. So you really just kind of have to gauge on how fast the clouds are moving. If you're shooting a night time-lapse, I like to shoot it every one second intervals. Otherwise you'll have the Milky Way being jumpy. So Five seconds is a good place to start in terms of interval. Um, And I noticed in here, Kathy Chassie has already taken a a workshop with you. Yes, I know Kathy. (laughs) And she was at Dark Sky Week, not this year, last year. She gets around. (laughs) um, Okay, so Andrew's got a question. Any favorite artists or inspiration outside of Salvador Dali you followed or got you started? Um, in terms of photographers, <laughs> in terms of photographers, um, there's a photographer named Ted Gore, who is actually also a graphic designer. I started in graphic design. Um, so he was one of my main first inspirations. And then my good friend Joshua Snow is also an amazing, amazing, talented artist. So he was another inspiration. And I've shot quite a bit with him now because now we're friends. But Um, so that's in terms of photographers. I just really love surrealism art in general. Salvador Dali was my favorite, but I also, um, really like just surrealism art in general. It's just so funky and fascinating. And the whole culture behind it is really trippy (laughs) when you get into art history. Um, but also Picasso, I'm a big Picasso Starry Night fan. Can't leave that out. So yeah, those are probably biggest inspirations to be honest. Yes, this was a perfect presentation <laughs> in this year with because you have kind of kick started. You know, we it's winter, it's dark, it's I don't want to go outside. And <laughs> a few other people in this room are feeling the same way; they're just not willing to admit. Um, but this kind of gets kick starts your brain into okay, let's plan for next year and mm-hmm. and after the holidays are swept away and and boxed neatly and put away. Where are we going? What are we doing? So hopefully people got some um, ideas and um, will borrow from your creativity and the, the stories that you had were yeah. very inspiring and very fun to listen to. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And seriously, to anyone in here and anyone watching this, if you ever struggling, have some questions or anything or want to bounce ideas off someone or share your work and get some feedback. I'm always open ears. So feel free to either hit me up through the website um, or Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. So always happy, happy to help you guys. Thank you so much. 
All right, guys, tonight is the last happiness hour session for 2023. I want to wish you a safe and joyous holiday, and I look forward to seeing you next year on January 4th when Charlotte Rhodes joins us to share her presentation, Africa, Finding Magical Light. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful, and I hope that we see you again soon. Mm -hmm.